Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Margaret Gray, and I'm Dean of the School of Nursing here at Yale, and it is indeed a pleasure for me to join Diane in welcoming you to this master class on the growth and development of nursing leaders. The school is delighted to co-sponsor this event, and I, like you, look forward very much to participate. The program is intended to pro provide a different perspective on nursing leadership by leading participants through a series of questions aimed at influencing professional introspection and action. It's now my pleasure to introduce Diane Vorio, who will take us to the next step. Good morning, everyone. And for myself included, I, I am so delighted to be here at the podium with Dean Gray as a former student and graduate <laughs> of the Yale School of Nursing. Um, I, and I am so honored to be here with two internationally known speakers and authors whom Dean Gray will introduce formally in a few minutes. For those from Yale New Haven Hospital, we recall on November 18th, 2010 at our nursing leadership group, I used the master flat uh, class format that I observed as a student of Donna Deers to interview the leadership of the CCU and the staff. And I think all of us can recall it was a very memorable event with high ratings on that NLC. One of the highlights of that interview was the exchange with Noreen Guerrero, the manager of the CICU, based on the last chapter, one of my favorites, titled Choosing Excellence. It was truly inspirational and very timely as part of our magnet journey and leading as transformational leaders. One of the most beautiful lines in that chapter relative to all our work today is, and I quote, the elevated expectations become part of the fabric of everyday behavior. I absolutely love that quote. It is a timeless statement and ever so meaningful as we embark on a new fiscal year. I have no doubt today's objectives will be met and exceeded as we look at insights on leadership development, a gain in the understanding and the elements of leadership, and the recognition of nurses' role in national healthcare systems. Dean Gray, would you do the honor of introducing our speakers? Thank you. I'm going to preface this by saying I could, I could probably do the whole program by reading their, their long and wonderful bios. I chose to give you the opportunity to hear them and not me describe what they've done with their lives. It is my pleasure to introduce them to you. Professor Donna Deers, known well to many of you, will play the interviewer. Donna is the Annie W. Goodrich Professor Emerita and Lecturer at YSN. She also holds Adjunct Professor appointments at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, and at Sydney University as well. She has received numerous honors, including last year being named a living legend by the American Academy of Nursing for her many contributions. <laughs> for her many contributions to nursing and healthcare. Our guest is Angela, McBri Angela Baron McBride. Dr. B McBride is a proud YSN graduate in psychiatric nursing and holds a PhD in developmental psychology. She served as Dean and Distinguished Professor at the Indiana University. In addition, she has led such prestigious organizations as Sigma Theta Tau and the, and the American Academy of Nursing. She has received many honors and is, too, a living legend um, of the Academy. As I said, much more could be said about each of these extraordinary women, but you want to hear them and not me. So on to the program. Good morning. Let me say a few words about the format today. This is going to be a master class in which I will engage Angela in conversation about her, her life, her career, uh, and I promised her I will ask no embarrassing questions. Uh, the master class format that I'm using is adopted from a, a, a television show on the Bravo channel that I'm, I'm very fond of, and Angela, it turns out, is too, called Inside the Actor Studio. Do you know it? I have rather liked uh, that way of, of engaging with people to talk about their life and their work and what it means to them, and so 
I'm going to do a, a somewhat modified version of that. In the interest of transparency, you should know in advance that Angela and I have been friends for a very long time. We counted last night over dinner 49 years. <laughs> we were classmates at Yale. We were classmates in psychiatric nursing together at Yale, and we were known for cutting certain, certain classes so that we could escape to the movie theater down the way to watch science fiction. <laughs> it didn't harm us, I don't think. Not at all. Creativity. Yes. <laughs> so with, with uh, that as, as introduction, I will uh, talk with Angela for a while. Uh, we will have some room for in, engaging you with, uh, with her. Uh, and then I'll wind it up at the end, and then we have some other entertainment after that. So without further ado, Angela, you uh, were born and grew up in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. What was Baltimore like in those days? Um, I grew up in the 40s and 50s. Uh, one of the little known facts about me is Nancy Pelosi and I were in the same high school class. We are the answer to a trivial pursuit question, and that is, who in the 1958 class of the Institute of Notre Dame went to Washington for college? She went to Trinity College. I went to Georgetown University. Um, it, I grew up, um, Baltimore then, and really still to some extent, is a lot like Chicago. It has a lot of ethnic enclaves, I grew up in the part where Polish was, um, my, my relatives were all Polish background. My mother was born in this country, but, and, and my father too, but they, uh, particularly my mother, her first language was Polish. Her mother and, had, and father had emigrated. So you could do, you could go to church, you could go to the grocery store, you could go to the post office and not have to speak English. Um, it was a world where um, uh, my father kept up my driver's license for 13 years after I left the state of Maryland. Um, I think because it was the kind of growing up where they never expected you to leave. Uh, the alternative explanation is he didn't think I could ever pass the driver's <laughs> test again. <laughs> Um, but it was a very tight-knit, religious, tr very traditional. With row houses. Exactly. Row houses. Uh, you see with, um, with the um, really tenement living, uh, multi-generation. I mean, if you wanted to run away from home, you could go within a block and find multiple relatives where you could go <laughs> and appear so that actually running away was actually a very safe, you didn't have to cross streets kind of activity. <laughs> your father was a policeman, right? And your mother? A seamstress. Uh, and in fact, if any of you have ever been to the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Cone sisters, who really were good friends of Gertrude Stein and collected Impressionist paintings, my mother was a seamstress making dresses for the Cone sisters. Um, so. Uh, every time I go to the museum and look at the wonderful Monets and Manets, and, 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 and uh, uh, there, there's at least some sense of a personal connection there. And of your two parents, which one are you the most like? You know, I would say I'm a blending of those two and my maternal grandmother. Those were the three people who influenced me the most. Um, my mother was eager to become a lady. She took a tea serving class in high school. And it touched me because, I, to my knowledge, she never served tea, but she always thought that that was somehow being ladylike and being refined and, and being appropriately dressed and kind. She could talk to anybody. My father was quick to anger. Um, ambitious, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I identified, he annoyed the hell out of me when he would say, um, I educated two girls to be nurses and they both moved away from home. 
because they were supposed to take care of me in my old age. So he, he held on to both old beliefs, but he was enormously proud. Though I must tell you, when I got my PhD, he said, you know, you could have been a physician. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, my father lived much longer than my mother, and he changed a great deal over time. So he really shaped me a lot in that the 30 years that he lived after my mother died, he really didn't have social skills. It was such a traditional family that people related to him through her. And when she died, uh, I always felt it was like double jeopardy. I lost my mother, and I now had to relate directly to my father, uh, who was very bluff. But he changed amazingly, and he convinced me. My doctorate is in developmental psychology, and I have always been interested in adult development. And I think I learned a lot from him. And then I mentioned my maternal grandmother, who we lived in her house all my growing up. She emigrated from Poland in 1905. She arranged passage through Gdańsk at the age of 13 and only told her parents in the last six weeks. She, it was funny, because once she got to the state, she was very traditional. But if you think about leaving your family and never seeing them again, which is what happened to her, I mean, unbelievably adventuresome. So I was the adventuresome, sometimes quick to anger, <laughs> genteel lady that the three of them made me, and that's who I am. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good characterization, yeah. <laughs> you went to Georgetown. Why nursing? You know, um, I do a lot of talks now on career development, but I'm always quick to say that the big issue for my generation was not career development. It was, do you work outside the home uh, once you're married and have children? So it was really, do you have a job rather than do you have a career? And I went to a really good academic uh, high school. I mean, so much so that my freshman year of college, I thought, easy breezy. I mean, it was like I, I was really a full-time theater when I wasn't doing nursing person. People thought I was a drama major. Um, but I didn't have to really study because my high school had been so good. But it was if you were, you were either commercial track and you took really uh, to become a secretary, or you were academic and you were going to become a K-12 through teacher or a nurse or a nun, in which case, you were going to become a K-12 through teacher or a nurse. <laughs> Career day at my high school was which cap would look cuter <laughs> on your head rather than the range of fields. So I really saw myself as having limited choices. My great uncle, who was the pastor of our parish, was good friends with the woman who was the, the nun who was the chief nurse officer. Well, she was really the CEO of Bon Secours Hospital in Baltimore. And he and I got friendly. I mean, that actually is an interesting influence in my life because my grandmother's generation kissed his hand because they were anointed and really didn't, um, you know, I mean, worshiped him really as, 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 as a priest. My mother did his laundry, so she was helpful. But I was the third generation, and frankly, I had more conversation with him. He had been a very good-looking man when he was younger, and he told me he was afraid to actually talk to women. And so when I went to college, I mean, he was already in his late 70s and 80s, and he was interested in college. Well, uh, before that, you know, he, he took some interest in me and introduced me over, so I wound up being, all through high school, I was a nurse's aide. I mean, I really, especially, I was one of those, uh, I, I really did so much nurse's aide work. And when I think of what they let me do, and I think of the legal liability of what they <laughs> let me do, I gavaged preemies when I was like 15 with see it, do it. Nobody did the explain it first. They, I just saw it and I, and I did it. 
Um, so that I had had a, a wealth of experience and I really had worked essentially as a practical nurse because they knew me well enough that I actually had a um, fair amount of responsibility. The good part about that, people were very suspicious of baccalaureate programs then and said, how can anybody go into a baccalaureate program? They don't have the same practical. For me, I had done already techniques that were not necessarily even taught in college because you learn them within the hospital structure. And I really liked the work and then um, really was interested increasingly in psych mental health. I was even early on. So I actually even went undergraduate um, more interested in that specialty. I spent a whole semester at Walter Reed Army Hospital. What did you like about it? What drew you to science? Well, my glib answer is our family was so poor we couldn't afford therapy. <laughs> so of the eight first cousins, one became a psychiatrist and two became psychiatric mental health <laughs> nurses. <laughs> so part of it was it explained people and I thought people were pretty mysterious and I wanted explanations. I also, I think early on, believe, and I don't know where it came from, that things could go better if people prepared you. I mean, a lot of that is even Rita Dumas' notion of preparing people for pre-surgery, but I didn't know that yet, but the notion of understanding things I think the Walter Reed Army Hospital, I only realized about 25 years after I had done it, that I think I absorbed, because I did all my psych nursing as an undergraduate at a military base, and nurses were officers, that I absorbed the notion that they were in control, mm -hmm. uh, that psych mental health nursing was independent, that you had authority. And, and you know, I didn't separate in my younger mind, that it was the military I was watching, not necessarily psych mental health nursing per se. But I also, between my junior and senior year of college, uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which was a big federal hospital, Ezra Pound was incarcerated there. I thought that was very literary. <laughs> and I was very interested in writing too, so Isn't somehow. Isn't that where Silence of the Lambs was filmed too? <laughs> yes, it was. But they offered a work study program between the junior and senior year of college if you had already done psych mental health. And so I even, that summer, it was a lot more work than study. And I was actually in charge of an, um, uh, a step unit that had like 50 patients on it. So by the time I finished it, I had really already even gravitated in the direction of site mental health. Um, I don't want to leave uh, college for a minute yet. You, talk, you said uh, people thought you were a drama major, and I know you did a lot of theater in college. What did that give you that has, has uh, stayed with you? Oh, uh, well, when I was at Georgetown, Georgetown was just like, Yale in the same time period, because I was there from 58 to 62. So it was, the college was all men. And um, the School of Foreign Service, the School of Nursing, well, School of Nursing was not integrated. I mean, we did not, ha we did not have men in the School of Nursing. Um, the School of Business, my class was the first class my graduating class was the first class that they took women into business. So there were a limited amount of women at Georgetown. Theater was something you could do in a group, lots of different activities. I love the esprit de corps of, of a lot of this. The man, we had a required speech course as part of our undergraduate nursing. And it was this man who then, uh, was the moderator for the drama club, and I liked him. He was very good about telling you how to use your nerves for energy rather than anxiety, because everybody has nerves, and you should just see it as something that makes you 
more engaged and you communicate that instead of the anxiety part of what you're doing. And he himself uh, did volunteer work in psychodrama at Chestnut Lodge. And so I actually hung out with him there too because I was interested in psychodrama as a technique. But I just like the camaraderie, the people that I wound up um, you know, uh, getting to know. Uh, you know, I tell you that I went to high school with Nancy, but I t also tell you that I went to college and did theater with her husband, Paul, who was in my year at Georgetown. John Guare, the playwright, was somebody that I knew at, as an undergraduate, and then he was getting an MFA in um, playwriting when I then came to Yale. So um, uh, the, I did my first two years, which were much more coursework, I did a certain amount of acting. Uh, but then the other two years, I actually stage managed a show. I did lighting. Now, I know nothing about lighting, nothing. But I know how to ask people in a nice way if they would help me. <laughs> and so I got, let me tell you, that was learning for the rest of my career. <laughs> because, I mean, I didn't name it that. But, but I can tell you, when I reflect back at the chutzpah I had to be the head of lighting when I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it amazes me. But you know, uh, and, and again, it's a quality that nurses have. We actually always work in teams. We, we are used to working with people. We're used to looking at and seeing who does what and then getting them involved. And so um, I would say all of those things, it was a lot of that was the sort of teamwork, the camaraderie, the sort of fun while you're doing something. And also, um, and, and this is true of Yale, but later on it just got reinforced. But I've always been interested in uh, literary. I mean, I have broad interests, humanities. I've always, like I wanted a college degree because I wanted to go to college and I wanted to actually do literature and not just all the stuff that you needed to do to become a nurse. And theater has, you know, you read plays and you think through, I mean, it was, it was a much broader worldview and, and that was important to me. And then frankly, uh, you know, I think those have been assets to me for the rest of my life. You're uh, one of the paragraphs that I like the most, and you've done it several times in, in your books, is the one in which you tell people what your parents' response was when you announced you were going to be a nurse. So. Um, I always... Um, my father, who was a police lieutenant, uh, said, good, nursing is something to fall back on in case you marry a drunkard. <laughs> um, and if you know anything about East Baltimore, there are saloons that sell very good crab cakes uh, every few blocks. And alcoholism was endemic as a problem in the community that I grew up in. And so, I mean, basically, I came into nursing via my father's worldview um, as a fallback in case I either didn't get married or he turned out to be a jerk. Um, and, um, you know, I marvel now as I talk about leadership, nursing as a fallback position isn't what you call a leadership stance. <laughs> um, my mother um, uh, said, oh, that's good because you can always use your psychology, the psychology and all the stuff that you learn in nursing school in raising your children. So again, her worldview was that nursing would help me with what would be my real goals in life, which would be to get married and have children. And so you, you left Georgetown and immediately came to Yale. How, mm -hmm. how did you make we that? We talk now about BSN to graduate school. And, um, uh, uh, you know, how do you get, you know, um, I had a first grade teacher who used to always say, God writes straight with crooked lines. And I would say my life, of, of all the statements that ever influenced my life, the comfort of God writes straight with crooked lines. 
I dated a guy who was the managing editor of the university newspaper when I was at Georgetown, and he went to Yale School of Medicine. And I came up to visit him, and he pointed out the School of Nursing on Cedar Street, right here. And so by the time I got to Yale, I was not dating him anymore. <laughs> but I had really, um, there weren't that many graduate programs, and I had a lot of pressure on me to uh, go to a Catholic university, which was the local master's program, and they were actually doing doctoral work very early on. But I really was, uh, what, uh, when he put the idea in my mind, um, uh, I really took seriously and, um, you know, did some inquiry, and then I applied. I applied to Yale, and I applied to Catholic University because all of my teachers at Georgetown told me I should apply to Catholic University. And I was hoping that, I, I knew that if I went to Catholic U at that time, that the people who taught me and the people who were there, it would be the same. And I wanted a, um, I didn't want a fifth year of college. And so I was thrilled when I got accepted by Yale. And what was your experience at Yale like for you? What did it do? Um, and I, I have, I write about it in the book on leadership, but I write about it, I wrote about it in a, a Yale Matters piece in the last year and a half. Um, I. I have always said that what Yale did for me was since the university always had a commitment to leadership development, it was the first time I encountered, um, well, let, let me go back and say I had had up until that time 16 years of Catholic education. And at that point, it was largely um, still a lot of nuns in your life. And so one of the things that Yale did was for the first time in my life, I met women who cared about the work that they were doing more than saving my soul. <laughs> and so uh, they were individuals who, I, I think they didn't take themselves all that seriously, but they took their work very seriously rather than as a means to an end for something else, like social justice or something. Uh, that's, uh, that's not a good example, because you do it for social justice. But it wasn't just always connected to like religious values. It was, this is important work from an individual work point of view, rather than doing the Lord's work uh, kind of thing. I think the other thing was, though, Yale itself was committed to leadership development. It always saw itself as producing leaders. And it was the first time I encountered people, and I didn't really understand it at the time. It was only over time that I understood what I, the messages I was getting. But it was basically the message of, you're bright or you would not be at Yale. So what are you going to do with your talents? which is very different from, are you good enough to be here? And I had always gotten a lot more messages about whether you're good enough. And so, and when people, and by the way, my PhD program was back to, are you good enough? Oh, was it? Yeah, it was much more, you need to do these 43 things and we will know when you do these 43 steps that you're worthy of a PhD. I, I'm, I'm being glib, you know, but, but to make a point, and that is I really do think that Yale was more, the focus was much more on the horizon, like are you going to seize the future? Are you going to grab something? And when you're proving yourself, it's, you're looking at your belly button. It's much more internal. It's much more 
even if you don't realize you're doing it, you're much more cocoony and am I good? And so this sort of more looking out, I think, uh, shape things. Many, 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 many years later, um, when I was doing the Yale Matters piece that Margaret asked me to do about what I learned at Yale, I actually did a quick and dirty survey, you know, one of those things that IRB never saw, <laughs> where you say, uh, what friends of mine, what colleagues uh, are fellows of the American Academy of Nursing? And I tried different generations, so it wasn't just people of my vintage. But I wrote just an open-ended, uh, when you think about what you got at Yale, what did you get? And it was interesting because it was a sense, all of them in different language really said essentially the same thing. They echoed this sort of sense of empowered to actually make a difference, to take seriously that you were gonna make a difference. Uh, much more interprofessional than I think a lot of other places are, much more emphasis on uh, being innovative. Social justice, that's why before I said, when I said social justice, it was not a really good answer, but much more making changes in the world, but these were not connected to you do this so that you get sanctifying grace, you do this because of a deep-seated concern about the public. And, and those, of course, those values meld together. I'm, I'm not being pejorative about the other, but they put them in language that, that doesn't have to be religious. And I, I found that enormously empowering. At the time that, that you and I were there, the, the actors that were around included Virginia Henderson and Florence Wald and Rita Dumas and Ernestine Wiedenbach. Do you uh, retain influences that any or all of them had on you that you? Well, I think the person of, of that group, uh, Rita and Virginia, influenced me the most. Um, uh, Rita uh, was the chair of the department. She was, in a sense, my first academic boss. I mean, Florence hired me but then Rita became chair of the Department of Psych Mental Health Nursing. Um, I, I always found that Rita was, um, first of all, fun. I liked the idea that somebody who cared deeply about the world was also a lot of fun and would play the piano and sing. I mean, I can't do either, but I really <laughs> valued that in her. She was always interprofessional. Uh, she always, I think, had the big picture. Um, I think the fact that she, in a very practical way, as uh, while Rachel Robinson was the first uh, chief nurse officer for the Connecticut Mental Health Center, she then followed Rachel in that position. The notion that practice and academia were not separate domains, but they should be connected. I saw that in her, and, and I also saw in her someone who was particularly good over the years of facilitating, mentoring you, but then being your friend. She gave me the model of you could have somebody mentor you and then your relationship could change to the next decade and the next decade and the next decade and the next decade. Uh, I was dazzled when she became deputy, well, she went to NIMH to become the head of psychiatric mental health nursing, then she was the head of the manpower part, so all of, uh, uh, and then she became deputy director. At the time, she was the first non physician, first woman, and first African-American. So he's a triple header. And it is because of Rita that NIMH then incorporated what was forevermore in training grants, and that is emphasizing what you were doing to address the needs of the unserved and the underserved. So that, um, she showed me that you could get a bureaucratic title 
and actually shape a policy in academia. You know, when you shape training grants, you know, that, that seems pretty unconnected to practice. And yet her um, being able to get NIMH to be much more mindful of the unserved and the underserved, it was um, policy activity at the highest level. So Rita was just an influence, I think, throughout um, my career. Virginia was um, uh, just wonderful. She was open. She was fun. I tend to like fun people. Um, there was, do you remember that Christmas party that we had over here in Harkness? In the, uh, one of the most, at that time I have no idea what was a cafeteria lounge. It was the dreariest looking thing you would ever want to see. But she was in charge of Christmas decorations. She had us all carving ivory soap blocks, covering them with silver and gold foil to make them into candelabras. We had hundreds of candles. She collected broken pieces of jewelry. She made styrofoam. I mean, you know, um, what's her name? Martha. Um, Martha Stewart, uh, um, uh, I'm thinking of all the Marthas in my life. Martha Stewart would have nothing on Virginia Henderson. Uh, in terms of orchestrating, that place looked like a Christmas wonderland. So, so on the one human level, and really, these are messages about how you balance your life. Uh, Virginia was good there. Uh, you know, for, uh, Virginia never made five figures to my knowledge and lived a very long time. And so she made her own clothes and people would, the, the Thai nurses would invite her and she'd get Thai silk and she would, she had figured out exactly what style dress looked good on her and she made it in the most mouthwatering sherbet colors. And, the, and, and, and understanding, here's someone who always looks elegant Virginia Henderson got the first ICN award that is essentially the ICN Nurse of the Universe Award. And she got two and a half minutes to give thanks. In two and a half minutes, she connected herself to the name of the person that the award was named after, showing a connection between herself and the person who was being honored by the name but she also left one message with the entire group, and that was, we need to partner with consumers and nurses need to be on the cutting edge in terms of personal health records being in the possession of the consumers so that they know exactly and can just think, this would have been in the late 80s that she got this award. She was up in age, but just think of what a powerful message that was. So, but most of all, Virginia, when she did the last issue of the Principles and Practice of Nursing in 1978, I did the chapter on pain. And I met the deadline. I pride myself, for the most part, on meeting deadlines. Not everybody met a deadline. So every six months after I met the deadline, she would ask me for an update on resources. <laughs> Didn't I want to change the chapter to update it? No, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I was done. I met the deadline. <laughs> the fact that it took another six years to publish wasn't really my concern, is what's going on in my head. But I'm here to tell you, <laughs> I update <laughs> that every six months. And I learned some lessons about what real scholarship is in working with Virginia. So to say nothing of perseverance. Perseverance, yes. Um, how about Florence Wald? What do you remember of her? Uh, well, you know, I was here at the beginning of uh, when she got interested in hospice and brought Cecily Saunders. And I think that the... Um, I think the ability, 
I think one of the most important things for leadership is being able to scan the environment and see what are only going to be bigger issues in the future. And I um, marvel uh, looking at that when she met Cecily Saunders, and Cecily Saunders had a whole new way. And the first talk that I saw of Cecily doing here was all of the patients who had the cocktail that she put together um, to keep them comfortable, cogent to the end, and pain-free. And um, the, the, the fact that uh, Florence saw that as a trend, then did a sabbatical to go to London to study, and then brought a whole new idea with all of the, let's just say, lack of support that was greeted with, and, and kept moving. I mean, again, Virginia had southern persistence. Florence had a, a more northeast persistence. <laughs> But the notion of moving forward and always being concerned about what was on the horizon. Let's uh, move a, a little bit in, a little bit more deeply into leadership. What do you say to people in the many audiences that you've talked to when they say, "I'm just a staff nurse. I'm, I'm just a." instructor. What do you say to people like about leadership? Um, well, I, I tend not to be too preachy because I understand what they mean by I'm just. What, what you mean is, first of all, I think people have a distorted notion of leadership, what leadership is. Um, I've been very involved with the uh, Building Academic Geriatric Nursing Capacity Program uh, that the Hartford Foundation has funded to support pre-docs and post-docs, and we run a leadership conference before the Gerontological Society of America meets, and we've been doing this. This November, it'll be the 11th year, and we have actually had some of our pre-docs and post-docs not want to go to the leadership conference because they had a grant proposal due. And they said, this happened in the second year, somebody said this, um, I'm not gonna be a leader. Once I got my breath again, these are pre-docs and post-docs and they're not gonna be a leader, you know. That's when I went into the, my dear, you only have two choices, to be a leader or a lousy one. I mean, those are your choices. <laughs> because even if you don't see yourself as a leader, others will see you. And there is nothing so unseemly as someone who does have authority in a situation saying, it's their problem. <laughs> They're the leaders. And I think what happens is people, for the most part, and still the majority of people, equate leadership with administrative title. And what they really mean is wherever they are, I don't want to be a unit manager, I don't want to be, uh, you know, I'm not going to be the chief nurse officer, don't look for me, uh, I'm not going to be dean of a school of nursing, I'm not going to be chair of a department, I'm not going to be there. And um, the, the um, I do think, I say I understand when they say, just a nurse, not to jump on that. My inclination is to say I've been there because I think new roles are hard to take in and there's always a gap between taking a new role in and feeling comfortable in it. So that when you become a new mother, a new father, and somebody says something about you as mother or father. I remember as a new mother, somebody saying to me something and I'm thinking, this kid's in trouble. <laughs> if I, you know, I am this kid's mother. 
and I am responsible. <laughs> and yet I don't really quite feel like a, you know, a new mother, a new father, they don't feel like a responsible agent in the way, I mean, it's a role that you grow into. Or the first time somebody called me Mrs. McBride, you know, I'm old enough, we've been married long enough that I never thought of not taking my husband's name. And the first time they called me Mrs. McBride, I wanted a giggle <laughs> because, you know, I wasn't my mother-in-law. The first time somebody called me a nurse leader, I said, honest to God, the field's in trouble <laughs> if I am a leader. And so I'm telling you this because I've been there to not feel comfortable with the notion of me being a leader, me being the authority, because those were the times when there was a gap between where my head was, what I was comfortable with, and what was even perhaps the reality of the situation. And because I think there's that gap, I have become a great believer in the importance, both in academia and in practice, to help people go through that. Don't yell at them when they don't see a leader, but to, in fact, talk about it. My view of leadership is you are an individual, either designated or perhaps rising up in the group, uh, responsible for working with others to achieve organizational mission and values in a world that is constantly changing so that you provide, you act as a catalyst. There's got to be certain things in your person. Um, you have to um, engage people. You have to uh, ins try to inspire people to then, in the work group, achieve organizational mission and values, knowing that you not only achieve what are the current goals, but you have to always keep your eye on the fact that the very concept of health, the very concept of aging keep changing. And that requires us not to just achieve goals the way we've always done it, but to be mindful of the need to redesign things to keep achieving in the 21st century what have always been the values. See, values don't change. And goals, a mission doesn't change for the most part. But how you achieve it, the structures they use, the way you have to be savvy. Um, you know, in the olden days, we talked so much about the nurse-patient relationship and put such emphasis. And just think about how dated some pieces of that are if all you think of is being with the person. But now, we are not limited in our nursing by either time or place. Information technology has been transformative. And how to achieve things. I mean, we, and I was one of the people bitching and moaning, so, I, you know, I, I <laughs> take responsibility. But, you know, as you got shorter and shorter hospital stays, and what you could do, and there was a gap between what you were taught to do and what you could really do. And, and, and I think we felt like, um, you know, I've had to go through the understanding personally that if you hold on to the way you learned it as if it was credo, then in fact you're not going to be ready to really do what has always been the what we have done. Um, so um, that's a winded uh, uh, response, but, but for me, the answer to just a nurse is to really understand and help people understand that leadership should not be equated with administration. I always like to say, you don't have to have an administrative title to be a leader. You do hope that those with administrative titles are, are leaders. Um, and also to understand the, the, 
how you need to change over time. And you need to help people. And the mentoring doesn't just go in the early years. I think when you become Secretary of Health and Human Services, you will then need to talk to people who were in other cabinets to understand the tips, get some mentoring from them about how to be Secretary of Health and Human Services. So it isn't like something that just happens. You don't just need coaching in the first 10 years or the first 20 years. You continue to need, because there's always the next level of development. And the exciting part about that is if every one of us goes after the next level of development, and we don't get into a nurse is a nurse is a nurse. We all take on our passion in nursing to get good in the area we're good at. and We make friends with other people in nursing who are good at other aspects. The field gets much richer than the old, old notion. One of the things that you, your work so exemplifies, and your books particularly do, is the way that you've used uh, 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 introspection, if you will, or um, and self-analysis, or whatever you want to call the process, in in uh, fabricating <clears throat> where you're going, what you think, why you think what you think, where it takes you. To what extent do you think that internal process is absolutely essential for the development of leadership? Oh, I think it's absolute. I mean, I think people vary, but self-analysis honestly looking at your strengths and your limitations um, is, I think, the mark of really the best people. I, I, think, I think because um, it, it helps you see where you are. And it also has a very positive part. I mean, the more you analyze what's going on, you could have a creative thought. And you could actually get a good article out of this, or <laughs> possibly a book. Um, and so um, what began, I think, historically, is me trying to understand when my experience was different from other people's. So my first book on the growth and development of mothers was my experience wasn't like the textbooks. I mean, I, I had thoughts that were very different from what the textbook said. So, you know, at the beginning of that, it's to get comfortable with where you are and to try to figure out who you are and all that. But, but at this point in time, I'm very big on uh, self-analysis and understanding and trying to figure out the issues to simply to see where maybe you even take issue with what is the common agreed upon notion in nursing, because that's where the next round of achievements could be. You could have a new way of thoughts of doing things. You know, I'm one of these people who actually says, when you get to the stage where you say about your home environment, Lord, I could do better than this. Uh, this could be the mark of greatness. Now, the first time you say that, you don't mean that as a tribute to yourself. You mean that as an indictment of your environment. Lord, even I could do better than this. But, but I say that the more you begin to see things and have a different thought and, and whatever, the more that could be an indicator to you that you actually do have. It isn't that they're stupid. It's that you could be particularly bright and that you actually have a way of seeing something that would be helpful to sort of get new understandings or, or what have you. But I think constantly um, looking and, and seriously looking at your strengths and limitations, because I think you always want to go with what you're good at, and as I say, make friends with others who are good at what you're not. We do too much trying to make everybody into the same, and we don't do, and that isn't satisfying. People are going to be most creative about where they have the most passion. So the real trick is to how to get teams together that you have very different skills, and then you understand what you can contribute. Something else that characterizes your work in in a way that doesn't characterize others, is 
uh, and this is probably not the most felicitous way of saying it, but the leadership of ideas. Do you think about your, your, the way you operate as in the realm of ideas? I do, but that sounds so... <laughs> Ephemeral? <laughs> well, that sounds so uh, highfalutin. Um, uh, that sounds so... Um, like I was never the best methodologist, but if you get lots of data and you want to sit down and talk about what is the central message of your research, I'm your woman because I can look at a lot of stuff and try to figure out what are the two big issues. You know, like if you, I mean, like if you're doing a research study, you get a lot of things that are statistically significant at 0.05 or 0.01. You may, in a complicated study, have lots of stuff and not really know what your message is. And I've always liked the puzzle of that of like what is the main event, what is, and, and um, so I think it's probably not coincidental that I married a philosopher and we actually do have conversations about ideas. I was telling Donna last night that because Bill and I have written some things together um, that uh, the typical interaction between us is I get very caught up in something in practice, like I chew on something and then I say to him, you know, I think X. And he says, well, you read Plato's Republic, didn't you? <laughs> of course, Plato said that. And then I'm sort of disappointed because I thought it was, <laughs> it was original. a rather original idea. And, uh, uh, you know, so I am, I am, uh, I have been encouraged in my digressions by somebody who says, you know, you really ought to read Husserl because <laughs> what you're talking about is exactly what he was talking about, sort of like, and the good part is I don't have to read the whole book. I say, what chapter did you <laughs> find this in? <laughs> but I, I, well, you know, I'm a site mental health nurse. I actually, I I think a lot of being interested in behavioral health is to try to understand the psychology of the event. What are the forces on it? How can you be effective? Um, you know, like I'm fond of saying you go to school and you get a good background to learn what to do, but the rest of life you have to then figure out, now that you know what to do, how to get it done. And, and how to get it done gets into politics, it gets into environments, it gets into different, different kinds of people, different stakeholders. Uh, and then, so, so the notion of what are the forces has just always intrigued me. One of the... Uh things that I, I think I've uh, learned about leadership is that as one uh, takes on increasingly executive responsibility, whether it's as the head of an organization or as a dean or as a program director or whatever, there's a shift that has to happen in how one thinks about the work. Have you thought about it that way? Say a little bit about like being the head of an organization where what are the, the leadership challenges that, that occur particularly at that level of? Well, let me give you a concrete example. I mean, one of the biggest issues uh, when I was dean of the School of Nursing, uh, is uh, I looked at the job description and I took issue with the job description. Uh, I did not take it when I was being interviewed. I don't know that I had <laughs> looked at it that closely. But um, it was a job description uh, that, and, and actually the faculty still had expectations that you would be a big player in moving forward the curriculum. And when I looked 
at the job description, at, and I did talk to the president of the university, the chancellor of my campus, and I had been at that organization, and I actually um, didn't set out to be a dean there. I, um, uh, the previous dean had uh, uh, left. There had been some faculty dean struggles, and so I became an interim. Uh, I had been the dean of research. Uh, but there was really the belief that um, I went into that job thinking that one of the problems that the School of Nursing had was that it was not really connected to the larger university. And that um, there were, uh, the community didn't know that the School of Nursing existed. And so when I did like my own analysis of what needed to be done for the next level of development when I was dean, I realized um, that uh, you, you needed a dean. I, I have to tell you a little something about this school because at the time, um, I've always said I've only taught at two schools of nursing in my life. One was Yale when it was the smallest school of nursing in the country and I then spent my career at the largest school of nursing in the country and I was dean of an eight campus uh, school of nursing that we had enough nursing students that were the equivalent of many colleges and I mean uh, we had in the major 2,000 students we offered associate baccalaureate masters doctorate postdoc did continuing education so it was this very large organization and faculty still expected the dean somehow to be more involved internally and I would regularly have to talk about that my job had two parts to do. One was to help them do their job, and that is to facilitate them in any way I could so that wherever the person was plugged in, they were as effective as they could be. And the other one was to be a boundary spanner, to connect the school to the campus, to the university, to the community. And I think I think understanding that, I don't quite, I can't answer how I got to know that as well. Uh, part of it was I talked to people in the School of Medicine and they didn't even know, you know, somebody once said to me, they're nice ladies, but who knows what they do? <laughs> well, uh, I took that to heart. That, that was something that we needed to do something about. Um, and so I think, even saying to the faculty, there are two parts to my job, was a way of coming to terms with, I couldn't do my job really the way it needed to be done if I just stayed in that building. If I just, and that, I mean that metaphorically, um, that you would just be concerned about the discipline. You had to be concerned about the discipline and the, and the connecting and insinuate the School of Nursing into what were the larger issues of the health center and the larger issues of the university so that we would be visible in the larger community and people uh, would have a better sense. I, I do think that whatever job you take on, you probably don't do that moving to that new job as well. It always takes a year at least to sort of leave the old job because uh, you're still connected to that. You still don't quite know what the new job is. Uh, and it takes a while to sort of grow. I think, I think one of the big generic things, and I, you say I'm revelatory. I, I only reveal what I think are generic issues. If I give an anecdote, I, I tell the story because I think it's larger than me. But I think most of us go through some period, like if I've been in a new role, it takes me a while. I still have residual, I'd be a good dean if the faculty were only better. <laughs> um, I would think I'd be a better mother if my children only acted better. 
I think I'd be a better wife if my husband was different. <laughs> I'm giving those concrete examples that you're all laughing at because you've been there. Because I think sometimes we have this rarefied notion of when we take a leadership position, what shape it should be in. And it takes at least a year or two to come to terms with the realities of the job. The realities of the job is this institution needs to go here. Like if you thought being a dean, maybe because you saw other deans go to receptions, was going to receptions or giving speeches, somehow you were ready for the go to the reception and give a speech part. What you didn't understand was there was no infrastructure in the school. They actually had not come of age in terms of computers. <laughs> so, so no matter how much you want to go over there, if your institution right now needs a good computer system and so that you can keep track, you know, these days we like to talk about data shaping decision making, both in academia and in practice. Well, but if you have no data, <laughs> you better get the data before you get into the decision making kind of thing. And I think there's always a grievance that whoever was there before, why didn't they make it all better? So that I, Obama must have that yeah. a lot. <laughs> I feel so sorry for him. Um, but, but the notion that somehow I, you could see my real leadership if this were a place were only in somewhat better shape. But I, can't, I have never seen anybody tackle a new position where I haven't seen a little bit of this behavior and then coming to terms with it and realizing that that's what real life is. As I'm fond of saying, you go to a good school to learn ideals, never thereafter to be in an ideal work setting. And all the rest of life is some approximation of your ideals with this less than perfect situation that you find yourself in. Why don't we open it up now? And Lori has microphones that she's willing to race all over the room and, and give to people. Do you have thoughts or questions or things that you'd like Angela to elaborate on? Anyone? Well, let me throw out an, another These are one not here. theater majors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I'm a member of Transforming Patient Care Team here at Yale. And um, I want to know, how do you think that resistance to change can best be met? I don't know. Everybody got that. How can resistance to change be met? Oh, if I could have a pill <laughs> that I could create and to give. You know, this is going to sound simplistic. Um, but I think understanding that resistance to change is always with us is the first step. And, and, I th and then understanding where the resistance comes from. Because I think... <laughs> Uh, a lot of times there is resistance. Uh, the, the top leadership and the middle management have been to a lot of committee meetings on the way to some change. They then share that change with other people who haven't been to the same committee meetings. So are not even, they don't really maybe even understand where things are going. So. I, I say one of the key ingredients of leadership is sense making. Have you done enough to prepare people for the issues that have convinced you and your other colleagues that are involved in seeing something go forward that the next steps are necessary? Because I think there really is often not as much communication. You say it once and you say, but I said it to them. And the reality is if you go back for any change, you have been to a lot of committee meetings so that, Margaret, I'm gonna, this is not personal, 
But you as a dean, you've got to meet with the president, you've got to meet with the provost, you meet with other deans, you meet with your own leadership group, you meet with leaders in service, you meet with other people. If, in, in, if you think about how many meetings you've been through, um, you know, and you say to somebody, and, and you wouldn't just do it cold, but if you would then just go and say, we need to go here, well, people will say, Where'd you get that? Where in the world did you get that? And, and so I, I think to, first thing I always ask is do people know, do they understand why the change is believed to be necessary? I think the second thing that influences people a great deal is will they look like fools as we move to change? That is, uh, if, if you're gonna go in, like if you're gonna adopt an electronic health record, uh, or some other uh, uh, technological um, infrastructure. Um, a lot of people who are in leadership positions are not real friendly with computers because they graduated from nursing school pre-1990. There have been studies that say from 1990 on we have people who are more computer savvy. But there are an awful lot of people who are that pre-1990 crowd who maybe know how to use stuff, but they know the bare bones, they don't really get it, they don't understand it. And so um, I, it was during my tenure as dean um, that we actually, when I became dean, very few faculty had computers on their desk. Um, and uh, one of my goals was, and, and this is not because I'm technologically astute, but I got it. I knew where the world was going. And I decided that one of my major goals was for every person in that building to have a computer and a printer on his or her desk with us then getting into a network where we then were gonna do the work. And I was fortunate to have an associate dean for teaching, learning, and information resources, Diane Billings, who was really good in this area. And, and she put together a plan. And we had a plan for one summer where we offered 12 hours of infotech um, for everybody. And the expectation was that there was no one who was in any staff position, no one who was in any faculty, there was no one in the building who was not gonna do these 12 hours. And we sent 10 or 12 people who were early adopters out to get educated to bring it back to then do it with us. And I, I think it was for me one of the changes that was successful because I mean, I took every one of those hours, I was dean, I sat with secretaries on either side of me, I informed them that they were more important than they realized because they were gonna understand how dumb the dean was in this area. <laughs> and I thought that was important knowledge for them to have. They were valued members of the community because I wasn't particularly good in this area. And, and I have to tell you, they helped me immeasurably. I mean, I can see this humorously, but you know, I didn't know the stuff. And I think the whole idea that uh, I, I think it was safe to admit you didn't know. Nobody was gonna say, and where did you go to school that you don't know this? And so making it safe to admit ignorance, having a program to prepare people for what will be the next level, it seems to me, uh, having them understand the need for the change and then making that nobody lose face in the brave new world that you are gonna prepare people for where it needs to go, at least helps it. But within all of it, I mean, I think um, we're all gonna be nervous. Over there, of course. Hi. This is just so, such an excellent conversation right oh, here, yeah, KK. Yeah. Um, you talked about nurses, leaders, the importance of that, you know, learning the skills of the art of negotiation, connecting with interdisciplines. In the academic world of nursing, in, co in terms of curriculum development, how, how, what do you see as the future for helping to develop nurses 
in the educational environment as well as in the clinical environment early on to help them. Part of it I know is experiential, but how do you help create that uh, learning in a mindset of you are a leader. You are a leader at the bedside. You are a leader in every meeting. Um, I think not using it as a slogan, but really believing that for this school of nursing and for this clinical facility, that nursing in this university and in this clinical facility, everyone is going to be encouraged, facilitated to develop a career, orchestrating a career for leadership. And that will mean different things. That will, for example, in service mean uh, as part of the orientation of the brand new nurse, talking about the organization's commitment to your development, the expectation that you will be a leader for quality and safety in our organization. You, uh, and I applaud very much your magnet hospital status, but you know, I think you begin with, in the orientation, saying you're at the beginning, and as you go on the journey from novice to expert, to use Pat Benner's language, we are committed to development, and that this has concrete meaning. So that it means that the orientation is mindful of you getting um, your sea legs, facilitating you, uh, that it is an organization that is constantly, if you're creative, thinking about making you a member of a committee where, in fact, you can grow to be an important member of a committee working to maybe uh, tackle some quality safety issue. And then, um, uh, and talking about the development there, uh, uh, you know, as you move on, sending you to Wharton so that you can um, be get a leadership program in the School of Nursing. They think through um, um, helping you have an internal mentor to facilitate, have mentoring activities. Uh, knowing at the beginning of teaching, uh, you're, you're going to be hard, maybe having a brown bag series that you deliberately have to share teaching tips so that people can come together and admit that this is a problem for me in my teaching. Uh, having someone who, uh, encouraging, uh, I mean, for me, it's a combination of do you have the organizational value? that we are, you are professionals and we will maximize you using. The Future of Nursing Report talks about working to the highest level of your educational degree, your license, and your certification. And does the organization in different ways show that it is committed in, in that direction? And show it in different ways so that there are maybe individual mentoring opportunities. Organizations are more and more having mentoring structures, not just individual mentors, new administrators going into senior positions, and the organization is investing in that person getting a coach for a year to help you, um, uh, you know, colleagues now who are taking some top positions, I always ask them, to um, ask for a coach. You know, if you're negotiating a position and they don't offer it, tell them that you need a coach of somebody that you can talk to honestly as you move into a major senior position. Is your organization trying to get everybody in that organization, if there are national opportunities, like the Robert Wood Johnson Nurse Executive Program, do, do you think about sending somebody and nominating somebody for that? Um, for junior faculty, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Nurse Faculty Scholar Program. So I think if you, 
and, and for me, it's leadership for a purpose. You will exert leadership in what, wherever you are um, and on, on, on behalf of uh, the people you serve. Um, and, and, you know, some people use the rhetoric and they don't follow it up with concrete change organizationally. And then people just get cynical because there's a gap between what people say and what they do. But I think to really, the more you do that, um, I, I think the more you uh, talk in that language, uh, I mean, I think it has secondary gain for the institution because the more you do that, the more those people do act as if they're authoritative in key situations. They are on committees and they are effective. They, they, they insinuate themselves into university stuff and larger hospital stuff, interprofessional stuff. Uh, I think in service right now, I have never seen in all my years as much possibility for nursing as I do now with all of the IOM quality safety work. Because I will tell you, if you have people in the top positions who understand that quality and safety are as important as fiscal solvency, and I'm saying that at the board level of the hospital, and then it permeates down, and I'm lucky to be in an organization that is like that, um, I have seen, and I have to tell you because I've been there a long time, um, I have seen that whole clinical facility value nursing in a way that they never did 20 years ago. Because whatever happened in the nurse-patient relationship, other people didn't see. But these outcomes, which are the metrics for quality, safety, and frankly, increasingly reimbursement, they now see a connection between quality nursing and money. And, and actually, that's enormously powerful. And all of the quality safety work at our place has had physician nurse leadership. And, and I am in no way being pejorative for physicians, but they, many of them don't work, they don't work for the system. But nursing works for the system and has often taken besides they have more of a system orientation to begin with in their socialization and education. They, they work with physician co-leaders to address a quality safety issue, and then the outcomes, which are more visible to the rest of the hospital, has, in my experience, um, there is a belief that those nurses are leaders and they are authoritative. That's a great place to sort of wind it down, I think, and I'll ask one last, last question and then we'll have some refreshments and other entertainment. What keeps you going? Um, I do aquasize four days a week and I have a personal trainer at a place called Miracles. It still hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, but the disintegration is slower than otherwise might be expected. Um, I'm being funny, but I think I care deeply about what my profession is about and about the power of my profession. And I'm excited. I mean, I, I genuinely, this is not rhetoric. I believe that there has never been a better time to be a nurse. I think our generation, Donna, and again, I'm talking very broadly, was more concerned with building infrastructure. That is, there weren't graduate programs. We actually did a lot to build graduate programs, to um, develop. Um, there wasn't research. You know, there was a time when you talked about the promise of nursing research. Now, you don't have to talk about promise. 
you can pull out, what is it, 30 some issues of the annual review of nursing research and give examples that are appropriate to the interest of the person you're talking to. Uh, the NINR uh, exist. Um, you know, Mary Wakefield is the head of HRSA. Shirley Chater was the commissioner for Social Security in the first Clinton administration. Um, you don't, you don't, I think for us, while we did a lot, a lot was helping nursing be able to fulfill its destiny. I think now we have infrastructure, we have standards, we have journals, we have organizations, we have certification, uh, we have uh, science, we have Magnet Hospital. And, and with all of that, we, we then also have people who can build on it. I mean, for my generation, we had so many people who wound up getting a doctorate when they were putting their kids through college and they, um, they got the degree more to get the degree rather than to use the degree for the next level of development that they were gonna use. Now we're, uh, we're back much more than we used to be to encouraging I think we still need to do a better job with different strokes for different folks. We still have some of that old, um, if you go right through an academic, you won't have the experience. And I say to the people who go right through, you gotta know what you know and what you don't know. That's why you need clinical colleagues that you then can collaboratively work together because you've got things they don't have and they have things you don't have and you need that team. But I have never been as excited about the prom, the possibilities, the existence of what is there for nursing. So thank you. And thank you all. Angela has agreed to sign books should people uh, wish their, if you brought one of her books to be signed, and there are books for sale out there, I believe, and there are refreshments. <laughs>